alive. <laughs> Happy spring. Uh, welcome to the Hoboken Historical Museum. My name is Bob Foster. And of course, when I saw what a beautiful day it was, I got a little scared. Like, are we going to have an audience? But luckily, that is not the case. So uh, again, welcome inside. Um, I see the title of our talk is Dispatch Days. Just wondering how many Dispatch or Jersey Journal or Hudson Reporter people we have in the room. OK. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of uh, a reunion event also, which we've had through these talks. Um, so uh, right now, the museum is featuring an exhibit called The Fires, uh, Hoboken 1978 to 1982. And a little hard to see the exhibit when we have you know, a good sized audience like this. Uh, at the end, we'll be pulling up chairs, and hopefully you can you know, hang around. We have uh, some refreshments, so don't run away. And uh, I will say we'll take questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, we've had, I think, two or three lectures to date on this topic. And as this exhibit uh, moves on from January from when we opened, and now we're going into spring, I'm going to say it's been one of the most uh, relevant exhibits we've had. Uh, everyone, if they were around in the 1980s, knows about the fires. But I can't say it's really discussed that much. And in a lot of ways, we're not taking the museum is not taking a hard stand on this of who's to blame and you know this type of thing but we are saying they did happen and it is part of our history and as we know hoboken sort of has a new population every two years or less and so that i'll say the bulk of the people have no idea about this and so we're really proud to be displaying this exhibit we're thanking our funder, which is the New Jersey Council of the Humanities. And we did have a guest curator who dug deep dive into this and in telling the story from the survivors of the fire. And his name is Christopher Lopez. Um, so that's just sort of some bare basics. Uh, I do uh, like people to know that we have a great digital newsletter. And you can sign up for it. You just go to the website. Uh, if you're really hardcore, you can become a member. But just to sort of test the water, sign up for the newsletter, and you'll be getting kind of a synopsis of events like this, but more importantly, what's coming up next week. And I should mention next week uh, that uh, coming up on Sunday, April 2nd, uh, we have uh, Mark Singleton uh, discussing uh, the founding of the shelter with Rand Hoppe, who's right over here, and they're members of the shelter team here in the audience. But uh, from, I believe, how Mark will be discussing it is that the shelter, which is probably one of the more vibrant or probably the most vibrant social need organization in Hoboken, it really was founded as a response to the fires. So we'll be learning about what I believe the shelter does and how it came to be. So here we are in the room. Uh, I'm about to step off. I just want to give a really warm welcome to Bill Bear, who has been part of this uh, community for a long time. Uh, he will give you his background. He photographed for years for the Dispatch, then later the Jersey Journal. But from what I understand, the fire years, as I will call them, at least as outlined in the exhibit, he was a dispatch guy. Uh, and uh, as all uh, motivated journalists, photographer types, you just got to adapt. And he has adapted. Uh, he is no longer doing photography uh, for, shall we say, uh, the newspapers but he's actually very involved with the shelter. So there's a little crossover. And as we say, you know, community has, you know, certain really good people, and chances are there's a lot of intersection. So let's welcome Bill, Bill Bear. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm Bill. Uh, if you haven't guessed by now, but uh, I started my career in photography, <laughs> in photography, uh, freelancing. I was freelancing at the Passaic Herald News, then later 
uh, at the Morristown Daily Record, uh, just through a friend. You know, he said, why don't you come up and show a picture? Hey, that's good. That's how it started. And I just started building up a portfolio. And while at the Herald News, uh, by word of mouth, there was an opening at the dispatch in this foreign land called Union City. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I said, okay, I'm gonna go for it. So I uh, put my stuff together, portfolio. You just simply meet with a managing editor, photo editor, whoever it might be, open up your stuff and show prints. And they liked what they saw, they hired me. And I was like, whoa, bright as buttons at whatever I was, 24, so 25. You could come out with one little portrait every time, a little trouble here. You could actually take it off. I'm horrible at that, yeah. <laughs> be like, no, oh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> Is that good? Is that good? All right. So, uh, yeah, so at 25, you know, I come into this uh, foreign land of Hudson County. Uh, I grew up in Bergen County. And, it, you know, 1978, late in 1978, uh, I was let loose on the streets of uh, Hudson County, you know, from, from northern Hudson all the way down to Bayonne. And to me, it was a wonderland. It was like, whoa. You know, where, where did this land and people come from? And I just started photographing, you know, and, and at the dispatch there, we're really heavy on spot news. Spot news is uh, fires, crashes, crime, all that good stuff. And um, they were heavy on that, but also heavy on just finding everyday people in the community to photograph, uh, you know, to put in the paper and just say, here's a, a piece of life from Hudson County. So, uh, oh my God. Oh, why did I do that? So, uh, crazy, right? I look at it and I'm like, so, but anyway, yeah, exactly, Tom. Uh, it was just funny. I always kept my press credentials from various uh, events and occasions. And one of my favorites, you can't see it, but it was George Bush press conference, it was handwritten. He was just starting his, his uh, uh, 1980 press, you know, for, to run. And that's all he can do. You know, nothing fancy, he's just, here, yeah, George Bush, you know. Nice guy, though. Um, the Dispatch, as some may remember, the rooster. <laughs> Gotta have the rooster in there, because it was the first thing in the morning, that's how they portrayed the Dispatch. <laughs> Or as some people said in the community, you wish it were your last, you know, after they read the paper, but uh, it was always funny to, to see that. And I have to pay honor to, uh, hmm. Sorry, some really good people uh, that I work with. Lena Sun on the left. She ended up, she's still at the Washington Post, really, really good reporter. Uh, Betty Liu, um, she did Daily News and then Freelance, I think. Uh, Smith, he ended up at the New York Times. Roy Kahn, uh, Freelance is down in DC to this day. Really good journalist. Willie Fernandez, he's in a league of his own. I'll get to him in, in a minute. And I don't, I'm not quite sure who that other person was. <laughs> a lot of people go through newspapers in the beginning of their career. Uh, again, this is uh, uh, part of the newsroom. Back then, people would write their stories, we would do captions, and then they went into this cubicle. And you can see, see the computers? Those are the computers back then. So, you know, I think there was a floppy in there. I'm not sure, it was just like a nightmare. And, but it was a fun room. It, it, it was right off the newsroom. And I have to tell you, a newsroom, like a real newsroom, none of this cubicle set up like a life insurance company, it was everything. It was, it was theater, it was comedy, it was drama, screaming and yelling, and then very nice people. <laughs> it was such a great mixture, mixture and I, I miss it dearly. You know. Uh, like I said, that's Willie Fernandez, and uh, he, that's at the Salo uh, Fish Market, as you may recall, yes, of course. And Willie uh, was working at the market. His dad came to this country, he's from Cuba, came to the country in 62 during that time. 
And he ended up working at this fish store for years. And I mean years, just hard worker, American story, right? He ends up buying the fish store. And Willie, his son, of course, followed in his footsteps by working very hard, the American dream, yada, yada. Funny guy. All Willie wanted to do was, you know, get through college, get through, you know, journalism, become a lawyer, make a boatload of money, get a big house in Miami. And he did it. <laughs> he did it. So, uh, the American dream. But he was a great guy, great, great guy, and very compassionate. Uh, people throughout the dispatch are just very compassionate. <laughs> Ted Boswell, he was on my staff at the, uh, at the uh, dispatch. Ted was a Spring Springsteen fanatic, just crazy. And we were in some burnt out place or whatever, and he goes, Bill, Bill, take my picture. I look like Springsteen. <laughs> <laughs> Because the album, The River, just came out, you know. So I'm like, all right, Ted, cool. And this is, I don't know if, it, I don't see Chuck. But it's Chuck Zoller, uh, fellow. So he was a staff photographer on my, uh, on my staff. I hired him out of, right out of Syracuse uh, Journalism School. Uh, great guy, great person, very compassionate, excellent photographer. Uh, and we've been friends for the last 45 years, whatever it's been, you know, good guy. And this is really funny, the caliber of people that started there. This is Adrian Benepe, who later became the uh, parks commissioner under, in New York City, of uh, the entire park system, under Bloomberg. So he ran the park system for, for eight years under Bloomberg, and now he's with the uh, Conservancy, I forget the name, the actual full name of it, the Land Conservancy of New York and New York State. Doing quite well. He, again, he, he was really, really nice guy, compassionate. And that brings me to Chuck Sutton. Uh, Chuck is an old dear friend. He passed about eight years ago. Uh, Chuck and I worked every single day. Chuck covered Hoboken, covered the fires, covered everything that moved in Hoboken. And we just got into this routine. I we're going in the morning, you know, 9 o'clock, 9.30. Depends on how late we were all out the night before. And uh, Chuck, what do you got going? Well, Bill, I got this or that. But OK, let's work on that today. So we do that. And I'll get into that in a little bit. So <laughs> Hudson County, you know? I mean, when I said it was a wonderland, it is, you know? <laughs> So I'm just standing, I forget where, I think it was down by Liberty State Park, I'm just standing there. I'm like, oh God, I got nothing, what am I gonna do? And I, and I looked down the street, and I was like, you know, <laughs> here's this guy on a bike with this giant German Shepherd on his back, <laughs> shooting, 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 I go, wait a minute! <laughs> so I ran after him to get his name and stuff. And, and it, typical, so Hudson County, it was, it was just, such a, a, a gem, you know, to meet someone like this. And, and you know, so we talked for a while, and he, he's very jovial and really, really, really nice person. Uh, and, uh, you know, Hudson County. It, it just, you know, love it. Yeah, I'm a dog person. <laughs> so again, you're driving by, you know, and you're like, yeah. <laughs> You know, here's the doggy car wash, you know, it's like, all right. You know, it's just funny what you find out here. And yes, nice sparkling waterfront out here. You know, that this is, it wasn't unusual uh, to find this on wherever, up and down from Jersey City, Weehawken, Hoboken. Uh, typically, a car like that, I can tell you, uh, stolen cars are usually dumped in the rivers. They were just, <laughs> if they wanted to get rid of it, you put it in drive, you get a brick, you put the brick in the gas pedal, and that thing goes, <laughs> launches right into the river. Uh, I don't know what thrill they got out of it, but, you know. Uh, one time at the base of uh, St. Paul Avenue in Jersey City, it's right on the Hackensack River, and the scuba team went down to look for evidence of some crime, and the, guy, <laughs> the scuba diver comes up and goes, it's gotta be 30 cars down there. 
you know, it was a good launching site, you know, it was like right off the end of the pier, it was like, I don't know. Uh, again, Hudson County. And that's, that's typical, the Statue of Liberty with its butt face in Jersey City, you know. Uh, but it was always fun, still is, I mean, to drive around and have a scene like this. I mean, the Statue of Liberty, right there, you know. Love it. Uh, and it was fun just to, you know, bump into this stuff. So this is uh, just south of the Pavonia past up. That's all sand. That's not Bermuda. <laughs> that is Pavonia, Jersey City. <laughs> you know, World Trade Towers in the background. Uh, and to say it was surreal is an understatement. You know, I got down there, was sent down to someone who was in the river or whatever. Uh, they're harboring it from New York City. They can get scuba divers in the water in like five minutes, five minutes. And they brought this poor kid up, worked him up. Uh, but <laughs> to be up there was just so surreal to be standing in white sand. I'm like, you know, it was just crazy. But again, Hudson County. Again, waterfront, you know, the pizza box. I was sitting down there. It was a good place to go to chill out. Sitting, in a, I was sitting in a truck, and I was just, like, eating a sandwich, and I noticed this pizza box moving, <laughs> like, like this, you know. I look closer, I go, oh, man. That is one tough rat. I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, he's backpedaling, dragging this thing. It's got a Coors Light, whatever that is. Uh, Really funny, dragged, it into, dragged that whole box into like a secure area where you can look out for other predators, you know? Sometimes people, you know? <laughs> uh, but yeah, again, Hudson County. And typically, uh, you know, I'd be riding around, this is on a Sunday, you know, I just get a call, I'm like, Jane Fonda and Tom Hayden are in Jersey City, you wanna stop by and get a photo? I'm, well, okay. <laughs> Why not, right? You know? So that, that was the end, that was that, I mean, that's, Stories literally fell out of the sky in Hudson County. They just, they came back from uh, some, uh, I think it was Earth Day or something. They were coming through the Holland Tunnel on the way to the airport and they stopped at a, a housing uh, agency, invited them, like a nonprofit, said, we want you to see what we're doing here to, to house folks that really need housing. That was the hook, that's why they were there. That and there was a photographer from Life Magazine with uh, Jane Fonda. <laughs> so, yeah, well, they don't care about me. It was really <laughs> Life Magazine, but, uh, but anyway, they, it was not unusual to get a phone call like that. Back in the day, there's no cell phones, right? We had a, we had a beeper, you know? Uh, so, again, Hudson County. Uh, back then, I had a police scanner in the car which picked up police, fire, whoever, and that's how we got news, spot news. So you just listen, you listen, and listen. In some cases, this is only in Hudson County this can happen, back then, uh, 79, 80. I was just sitting in the car, and I noticed a big, huge column of black smoke coming up from a little west, or I'm sorry, a little east of the old Jersey City Medical Center. Didn't even come over the radio yet. So I go right down Montgomery, base of the hill. And back then, you know, from basically from the base of the hill where the medical center, the old medical center is, forward to the river, it was like huge pockets of poverty, huge pockets of uh, abandoned buildings, which was the case with this building. And this thing was really cooking. So it was abandoned, uh, but you can tell the fire was inside roasting, getting really hot, 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 you know, and then finally, you know, exploded. And uh, so I was there for that, and then I hear glass breaking, you know, uh, and this fire captain, of course, no mask, no nothing. <laughs> Back in the day, it was like, gotta be tough, kid. Uh, drags this guy out, brings him out through the, uh, the window, onto the fire escape, and saved his life. You know, saved his life. Brought him down. And then, uh, I think, yeah, then he was scolded out by 
uh, the Fire Protection Bureau, like, you know, why you in that abandoned building, blah, 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 who started this fire? You know, uh, it, was a, it was a lot of buildings like that where uh, they called them uh, heartbreak hotels, you know. There were a lot of folks that were on the street or found shelter in uh, abandoned buildings and got cold, you made a fire, sometimes it didn't matter what you were burning, and then that just turned into a massive blaze. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, like I said before, it was Disneyland when I got here, and it just continued. So I'm sitting up on the boulevard in 139 in Jersey City, and on the scanner I hear this cop screaming in the radio incoherently. And then I heard the word City Hall, and I look, and again, huge column of black smoke coming up right down Montgomery Street, pull up. I'm like, City Hall's on fire. How crazy is that? City Hall. So, you know, we did the usual photos, you know, the firefighters working to get the hoses out and get water on this, this blaze. And then I saw the statue and I said, that's it. That's, you know, that's the photo for me. You know, that's a, to me it said a lot. It still does. That statue is still in the front yeah. of City Hall. And uh, it was crazy. It was typical Jersey City back then. You know, the, the mayor, Tommy Smith, comes running up, pulls up in a car, jumps out of the car, looks around. He sees me standing there. I'm the only person with a camera. And he runs over to some of the firefighters trying to set up a, 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 I think it's called a stanchion, you know, a ground fire hose that really cannon. It's cannon. And Tommy's like trying to, he, just, he has no idea what he's doing. And the firefighter setting up the apparatus is like, what, what are you doing? You know? And Tommy always put on a good show. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, it was a four, it was a, the, every fire engine in the city was there. I mean, it was a full response. Uh, the rotunda, it was a beautiful rotunda in the, in the main entrance, and that's why the cop was bouncing off, he was just going crazy because all that glass came flying down with debris right where he was sitting, you know. So, uh, no. I mean, that's a lot of, that's, uh, yeah, parts of it were, yeah, parts of it were, you know. But the structure itself, I mean, that's, that's pure, yeah, you know. Again, dogs, I know. So, but, you know, firefighters have, you know, I mean, they're, you know, a fantasy is like, you know, you're you saving babies, you know, you have adults in your back, you're getting them out of a burning building, you save their lives, a rescue. And to me, this is like the lighthearted rescue, and they knew that. <laughs> they should be out there and they'd be like, oh, the dog. But it was really, really, it was a funny moment, and uh, a lot of moments like that. Those four years, you know. So, fires, you know, in Hudson County back then, I can't tell you how abundant they were. Just incredible. And firefighting back then, uh, you know, the, the equipment's all different, the protocols are all different. Um, you know, a lot of firefighters, it was like a macho thing not to wear a mask, you know. I've seen firefighters smoking inside structures, you know. It's like, okay, you know. Um, but, you know, it's pretty typical. And exhausting. I mean, I, I'm not a firefighter, but, uh, you know, the first, you know, four minutes on scene carrying all this equipment, you know, maybe hoses are on your back, whatever it might be. Your body exhausts real quick, real quick. You have to rehab all the time, meaning water, rest, you know, you have to do that. It's just very taxing on, on the body. I think more firefighters die from uh, heart attacks than from actual burns and, you know, injuries on, on scene. Uh, it's a tough, tough job. And Hudson County is just abundant. These are some photos from around the county before we get to Hoboken. Um, of just, you know, look like a mattress fire or whatever. I forget where it was. Again, just smoke, you know, tough job. 
and then this be, you know, started to become um, not unusual, unfortunately. You know, Hudson County, especially Jersey City and, and Hoboken, Union City. Uh, a lot of poverty, you know, a lot of people struggling to make a living, a lot of people struggling to get housing they can afford. Um, and, you know, along with that goes, you know, just a, uh, 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 you know, this is Union City. It, it just comes to, uh, everything comes to a head. You know, it's just this confluence of poverty and crime and, you know, economic factors. And, and in Hoboken, there was a, a 1%, uh, the housing market was only 1% back then. You know, I mean, that's all that was available, you know, that you might be able to afford. And, you know, arson is, as you know, I mean, it's like a vengeance crime, you know. And like I said, exhausting. Yeah, it's just exhausting. No mask, but uh, it is very exhausting, you know, if it is for folks that fight fires. You know. And, um, you know, we, we also at the dispatch, we, we really, really, really wanted to go out of our way, and we always did every day to help people that would call and say, hey, look, I need help, you know. We're getting thrown out today or tomorrow or next week, or, you know, my child needs a, an oxygen tank in the house, no one's helping us. So we get a phone call, and it's for, listen, we found this guy, he's living in a car, he's homeless, blah, blah, blah. I go, all right, so I go down there. He was living in one of those cars in the background, and he comes walking towards me. It was like Night of the Living Dead. And you can't see it really, but in his left hand is a paper bag that he's sniffing glue out of. He just poured in airplane glue. And, I mean, his brain was probably about this big at that point, you know, and just totally incoherent. He's, he's advancing on me. I'm like, I'm done. I was out of there. So, you know, that whole uh, fantasy thing, oh, we're going to help the poor guy. No. <laughs> uh -uh. Out, poor guy. And again, you know, Hudson, it always provided, you know, there's also a bit of artistry involved in uh, working at a newspaper, and, you know, there was always something, you know, something you can, you can play with, something you could uh, uh, just take and say, oh, I like, you know, I like the, the way it, it, it looks, I just, I just like it. You know, and submit that and be published in the paper. Um, and then Hoboken, you know, that's Kathy Yellow on the right. Tommy. Tom Kennedy, was it? Yeah. Okay. Tom. And Jimmy Farina on the left. And this is, you know, events that happened outside of Hudson County throughout the world affected things in Hudson County. And at that time, there was everything. 1980, you had, you know, Carter, you had the Iranian. Uh, uh, hostage situation, which is what this was about. There were like spontaneous uh, parades popping up around town and around, you know, like Jersey City. Um, there was one I remember at Jersey City State College, spontaneous. And people, it was just like three, four hundred people running around with signs and screaming and yelling. They closed down the boulevard, you know, they're jumping over the fence onto the campus. And I'll never forget the, uh, it was like a scene at an animal house, you know, where the parade is broken up and there's people running all over the place. And the PR person who was actually goes, Bill, do you think you could put your camera down? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, not going to happen, sorry. I'll never forget that. It was just so funny. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> again, we had Three Mile Island, right? happen in Pennsylvania. The president of Stevens decides to come out and say support nuclear energy. Not the wisest move, I don't think. You know, like, you know, it was just so anti-nuclear at that point. So I go down and I photograph and bathe him in, in sunlight. <laughs> just to make a point. <laughs> and he's like, is this going to show up? I said, eh, it might. <laughs> But, you know, it was so, working back then, it was just so great. And who can forget 
of course, from Clam Broth House. So the Clam Broth House, uh, you know, my, my father went there, his father went there. It, it, just a long history of, of families, you know, generations of, of going to the Clam Broth House. And when we got paid on Tuesday, the crumbs they threw us, we, uh, you yeah, know, we'd probably end up there, you know, <laughs> or any other, you know, local uh, place in Hoboken, you know, bar, not a cafe. Uh, and I always loved this picture, I, you know, when I took it, 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 it this is uh, right up the street from Apicello's, I think it was on First Street. And of course, there were empty lots in Hoboken at that point. I mean, there were a lot of empty lots in, in Hoboken. And they sent me down there. They, there was a grant for rehabbing the area. Uh, and I found these four kids. And I'm like, man, this is like, you know. I just lo I love the scene, the interplay between the two in the middle, you know. Uh, just growing up in Hoboken, you know. That's what it was like back then and all the tags and the graffiti. Uh, and like I said before, we at the dispatch, room full of compassionate people. Uh, we always got phone calls for help. And this was a building, uh, I think it was on Clinton Street, that the city owned. Uh, I guess the landlord or whoever owned it just took off, you know, left it, you know, the structure there and the city took over. And the city wasn't really equipped to, to handle that uh, at that time. And, uh, you know, I walked in, there's, you know, a few people, you know, but someone scrawled help, and that was right above, it was the entryway, the mail, typically you walk in, the mailboxes are right here, and help is right over the top. Uh, not unusual back then, certainly not unusual. Uh, we also did stories and people called, you know, the same thing. The same thing. Our landlord left, you know, uh, they, they're not fixing anything, you know, blah, 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 blah. And here are these two little kids in their bathroom, if you want to call it that. And that was not unusual. It just wasn't. And we really went out of our way to highlight problems like, like this and associated problems, you know. It, it just... They fed on each other, you know, the poverty, the, the crime, and of course, arson and fires. Oh, not to mention, uh, you know, the Mario boat lift that was, uh, you know, it just infused more people into the area. Uh, I, I remember distinctly to say, you know, going in, finding uh, the woman on the lower right, uh, she just exhausted, you know, just had it. You know, so I tried to bring that out, uh, but yeah, poverty just all over the place. And then back to Hoboken. Pier fires were not unusual in this area, uh, all up and down the Hudson River. You know, it went from post-industrial to, to just abandoned piers. And piers are treated with um, chemicals, can't remember the name of it, but it burned. It burned for days. And that sucker went on for a long time. Just burned to burn to burn, because you know, you, you couldn't send firefighters out there, they could fall through, you know, holes in the piers, and it was very dangerous. So you had to let it burn. No one's, you know, no one's getting injured here. And just let it burn, you know. But it, again, black column of smoke, and you just no, it's the pier, you know. I think that was uh, at the end of by Observer Highway, um, transit buildings at the end, warehousing, you know, they're probably abandoned at that point. And this is, uh, this is a fire, two people died in this, and that's again, Apicello's Fish Market <laughs> pops up. Uh, they had an apartment all over, over and then to the right was where the fire was. Uh, two people died, a mom and a small infant. And when I got down there, this is typically, you know, it was a newspaper. Uh, our deadlines were, you know, six, seven o'clock at night. So anything after that, we really didn't get to. 
we weren't there the next day, and it was most you'll see most of these fires start like in the middle of the night, you know. So we get what we get, and I run down there. I do a scene setting shot like that, and then around the corner comes the family down the middle of uh, First Street, and obviously very, very, very upset, you know. I did my job. Boom, 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 boom. A few frames, and not untypical. You know, they walk by, and one lady looks at me, she goes, you son of a bitch. And I'm like, you know, you just got to take that with, with the job, you know. You're actually, you want to show that emotion that people get really, really hurt uh, in, in a lot of instances. And I, I'm not going to sugarcoat stuff, you know. You're not going to run this, and it's like, oh, it was a fire here. You do that, but what does it say? Not much. The scene center. But the show raw, raw emotion out there, that's what can affect change. And then that was typical, you know, of uh, any fire structure anywhere. Just aftermath and just a lot of charred ruins. And, uh, you know, it looks like it might be an, uh, an investigator of some sort. So. Poor kid coming home from school. That's what he sees. Got his tennis racket there, you know. And this was uh, typical of fires, obviously in winter. Uh, a lot of water coming down in those hoses, a lot of spray, and at times it was cold enough it would instantly coat whatever it came in contact with. In a form, it was actually it was pretty, and then you realize no, it's not, you know. But and also we covered a lot of, you know, when the housing was really, I mean, it was just like I said, it was like one percent turnover. Uh, again, I think yeah, this is a building owned by the city at that point. Uh, people started to organize, you know, after a bunch of arson fires, people started to organize. Say, hey, we got to do something here. This is crazy. Um, and worked hard, and we just kept pumping stories out as much as we could. Any new developments, we kept it up there. I mean, back then, it's not like now. Back then, newspapers, you know, I, I had two papers, I think, were delivered to my household. I know a lot of people out here, same thing. But you read the paper every day. You just did, you know? It's not like, you know, your phone, you know? People are like, you know, where are you going to get the hottest latte, you know? It, it, it's a whole different world back then, you know, the detailed stories that you can read, you can take them to the bank, you know, and they meant something, and you could really affect change. That was the biggest thing about journalism back then, was on a local level, you can affect change, and that, that's what really kept me, you know, pumped up, going in every day. Um, you had to do that. You know, this poor lady, rats jumping out of her bed and stuff, and pretty typical story. Now this is, you know, they say, again, Hudson Cat, they sent me down there, and I worked with Chuck Sutton, you can see his name up there on the left. He says, Bill, you're not gonna believe this. I said, I am, <laughs> I'm gonna believe it. This poor child uh, at that point, her mom at that, at that age was uh, in her 50s, right? And her daughter is 19 years old, she's gone to like a, a special needs vocational school. And she was, she was brought there by bus, which the county or the city provided. But no one would take her, and she couldn't walk. No one would take her into the bus, no one would take her off the bus. So when she got home, you can imagine this, pulling up in front of your house in Hoboken, tenement. This poor thing had to crawl across the sidewalk, crawl into the hallway, and then crawl you know, up to the apartment, because her mom couldn't do it. It's just too much weight. And I, I don't want to belabor, you know, the, the idiotic BS that's in the story and the excuses the city had. You know, it was just, just absolutely insane. Uh, and there's some names you might, you might find familiar in there. Um, 
But again, it wasn't a, a atypical story. I mean, it, this stuff happened all the time. I mean, we tried to, to highlight people's struggles, you know, working, living in Hoboken back then um, to, to affect change. You know, how would it affect change? That's what it's all about. Um, and then, you know, eventually, I mean, things were you know, at this particular place. Uh, it was in Jersey City, but it was, it was typical of, of the area. Um, it, it was a building, like a four or five story structure. The landlord said, you know what, I'm done. I'm not going to fix anything here. It's filled with tenants, filled. And they called me on a Sunday, you know, my day off, and I'm like, can you go down? He yeah, sure, I'm on the way. So I go down, and I did a page of photos, which I couldn't find, and I apologize, and just of what these folks were going through. So it was typical. You know, you had the stove going, the door down on the stove. You know, I photographed a 90-year-old blind woman in bed with about 30 blankets on top of her. And it was just a horrible mess, as you can imagine, the dead of winter. And, you know, the folks eventually got organized. You know, there was a, a, a group in Jersey City that helped them organize. And it just came down to this horrible scene of, of them getting evicted by the police who did not enjoy that at all, who would who evict and poor people out of a, a structure. Just ridiculous, you know, it's criminal. But uh, yeah, that, that was, it was typical. I mean, that was typical, you know. And then this. Pinter Hotel. That's another page. Can you all see that? Okay. Every face in there. Like no one should see, you know, be like that. Just horrible. That's the aftermath. They and that, you know, the next day, it was light out. And then this is what turned into the norm for me uh, and my fellow photographers. Uh, you got there, it was the aftermath. And then it was a ritual, you know. Uh, getting bodies out of the buildings the next day in the winter, uh, the bodies were encased in water from the hoses. They had to be chipped out by firefighters, put in the body bags, and then lowered down the side of the building. It was such a, a horrible ritual. This one taken out of the back. That's the medical examiner. I wish I could say that was the only quote from someone who was there from the very beginning, but it's not. I talked to firefighters uh, the next day who were just mentally shot, and it was the thud that got them, that they didn't know what was going on. It was a sea of flames, smoke, and just, you know, falling to the left and to the right. That's lifetime stuff you carry with you. I think that's, that might be Hoboken. Pat, is that Hoboken? Ambulance? It could be Weehawken. Uh, but that's, that's the, the hotel is in the background there. Uh, small place. I actually stopped over there for coffee before. Never, you know, it was just like really surreal. 
<laughs> being there and getting a coffee. And I'm like, ugh. And it was the next day, you know. Uh, Weehawk and uh, EMS uh, just providing help to uh, first responders. Uh, the guy on the, in the middle uh, with his arm on the, on the chief's arm be later became the North Hudson uh, chief of all of North Hudson FD. Jeff Welts was his name. Yeah. Really, really good guy. Again, it was like like a slow drip of water going to these scenes, you know. It was always the same scenario. It was almost like a play, you know. You had a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, but you had to do it. You had to show it. You had to try and convey the horror of what folks went through and why they went through it. This is the... Uh, the final act of the building, you might say, and that was very typical. Bodies out, you know. Uh, investigation may be done, maybe not, and then knock down the structure because the fire is intense. It's structurally unsound. That's Harold Ruvalt. He just became prosecutor of Hudson County. It was rumored that. Uh, the Democratic, Hudson County Democratic Committee pitched him to be the prosecutor because he was young and able to be, uh, make it through the vetting of the state police for the job. <laughs> so, but that, that didn't stand very long. Five months later from that picture, that's what happened. He was indicted. Uh, the Hudson County prosecutor, it's like, you know, being the attorney general of Hudson County. It's a big, it's the top of law enforcement. Uh, he was found not guilty, uh, but here's the thing. <laughs> the two people that testified against him uh, were not exactly, um, how could I say this, uh, honest, you know, in their, in their lives, they're very corrupt. Um, but it's the same old thing, it's like a lot of drug cases are like that, crime cases are like that. You have to get testimony from bad people to get bad people. And with him, uh, the jury just went with, you know, the other bad people. But uh, yeah, he didn't last long. But that, that was another issue that really plagued uh, fires. And, and it's just all mushrooms, you know, from poverty to, to lack of housing, to lack of food, and then Hudson County was just so corrupt, you know, back then it was just like you're talking to one person one day, that's a nice person, the next day he's indicted, you know. It was just, that was typical. I mean, really, really typical. So after a while, uh, we in the newsroom just were at wit's end, like, when is this insanity going to stop? The evictions, the, the uh, people suffering, you know, inaction. Um, by government, whether it's the city or the county. Uh, we can tell that they just didn't have the wherewithal to tackle a huge problem like arson that was unchecked. Uh, it was just rampant, and people, a lot of people were dying. And finally, you know, we're just sitting in the news and you know, basically saying, what the, you know, and we get a call from the director of the burn center at St. Barnabas Hospital, which is a burn center at that time for the, uh, for the state. So if anybody would burn, you know, the state police would helicopter down a crew, bring them out to Barnabas, because that was really the only hospital in the area to do it. There was a hospital in Manhattan that had a, uh, a bariatric chamber, uh, which was used to speed up. Uh, burn injuries, and pumps 100% oxygen, positive pressure, you know, it's a very specialized uh, piece of equipment. And those are the only two places. So the director calls, calls us and says, and he was pissed, 
like really pissed, as were we, but he was really pissed. <laughs> and he says, listen, I, I'm sick and tired of people from Hoboken coming in here in the shape of coming in. Uh, I think the Pinter Hotel, I think there was one out of there, but there, there were, it might have been six, actually. What am I saying? Uh, taken via uh, Hoboken Ambulance and airlifted from Hoboken High School in the stadium. So the doc's like, listen, I have a family, kids from Hoboken, they signed, the family signed off on it. You can come in, talk to them, take your pictures, and, you know. So again, uh, like that picture from Apicellos, it's like you put it on a human level, you, you have a chance of making change. So this is Paulie Rodriguez, he's six years old, and every day uh, he would go through this. Uh, they had to peel off uh, all the gauze, uh, scrape it off, and then reapply, uh, almost like gauze, but it, it was specialized in that. It, it was treated and it, it helped uh, skin re, you know, regenerate on his body. But he went through this every day, six years old. I mean, everyone in that unit was on like a ton of morphine, pain meds like you wouldn't imagine. Uh, but you know, he, he went through hell. But if you notice, I mean, the, the, I don't know how they did it. I mean, I thought I was, you know, tough or not tough, but able to, you know, box off things in my head and, you know. I don't know how they did it, these nurses and the technicians there. It was just absolutely nuts. But look at the tenderness between his left arm, what's left of it, his fingers, and touching the forehead of the nurse. It's a tender moment, you know. That's just tough. Um, and again, I, there was no question we were going to use this stuff. You know, the next picture is going to be pretty tough. Not that one, the one after. It's, uh, we didn't sugarcoat anything. Everyone was so infuriated that anyone has to go through this. Again, I know, I know. But he's placing his right arm on her arm, not hard, and just, you know. That's arson right there. And that's arson back then. And Paulie came down, you know, and back to his bed. And uh. So anyway, we printed the photos. The lead one, as you just saw, is tough, right? But it had to be done. And here's the amazing thing, uh, you know, um, with pictures that are this raw and this powerful, and given the circumstances back then of Hoboken, not one single person in the paper questioned it, that we were going to run this. Not one. No one came up and said, oh, this is going to upset our readers, you know, blah, blah, blah. Not one. Laid it out. It ran. We got a lot, as you can imagine, a big response. Oh, this is one of my favorites, by the way. Uh, apparently, this woman up in Fairview, uh, she was extremely upset to see a gruesome picture of a young burn victim. I felt weak and quickly turned a page, which is good, because a newspaper, you're your own editor. You just turn a page. I applaud the nurses, yada, yada, yada. I... The part where she says, I expect to be informed, enlightened, and even entertained. I don't know. Can you imagine Steven Spielberg, someone saying, Schindler's List, I want to be entertained. I don't want to see this stuff. You know, come on. So to, that was countered by this letter. Uh, it was a woman uh, in West New York who, I think it was her son, uh, spent time uh, with Burns like that. And she, of course, has the opposite. 
Of course, my favorite line is, uh, it's a shame when she picks up a dispatch, she wants to be entertained, where there are, <laughs> there are always comic books because a good newspaper deals with news and facts, not fancy in the matter, how gruesome. And yeah, I agree, of course, a million percent on that one. Uh, out of that page of photos, the response came from all over the place, you know. Uh, this is just a pull-out quote from uh, a person at the hospital who worked there. And of course, people responded with, uh, uh, you know, calls and what could we do, you know, just help. Uh, I love that last line. You could really put a timestamp on it. One of those radios with headphones. <laughs> really funny. But it, you know, the, 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 those photos were probably, that was like the, the sledgehammer on, what do you say to those? What are you denying? What, do you, what can you say to that, right? This is just, <laughs> it's horrible, gut-wrenching, uh, and, and I think they had an impact, you know, I mean, things, you know, they, they, we always joke, there's, in terms of uh, corruption in law enforcement, there was a dispatch, we did a lot of stories on corrupt people who ended up in jail, and the U.S. Attorney's Office in, in Newark loved us. They just absolutely loved us. You know, we do like a, a, an investigative story piece on a, on a, on a politician, and, and, you know, they'd be indicted like whatever, six months, eight months later, uh, but they loved us, you know. <laughs> they just, we were doing some of their work for them. Uh, but, uh, you know, as a result of the work that we were doing and what was happening, there were community groups that really, really came up and uh, uh, took the lead, you know, to, to get some sense of control over uh, making things better uh, in terms of, of course, the arson, but in, in terms of housing. You know, the housing was just so, just, just horrible. And like I said, you know, before there were so many elements coming in to a head at that time. Uh, there wasn't any housing. Hoboken was just starting to be realized as a place to snap up something, you know, in terms of housing, rehab it, either sell it or keep it, whatever. And then it was discovered that you know, I would always tell people, you know, where do you work? Hudson County. I said, yeah, they have the best views in New York City. Why do you want to live in New York? And Hudson County does, right? I mean, it just does. The waterfront, beautiful, you know. Um, by beautiful, I mean it was beautiful back then, too. I loved it. The views were just like you couldn't beat them. You know, you just couldn't. And that was a big selling point. So that perked the, the, the interest of people wanting to make, you know, uh, investments in terms of housing. And uh, this is Juan Garcia. Uh, he was, he was, he was, <laughs> he was a very radical guy. You know, he's very, he told you what was on his mind. And he worked very hard uh, at, at securing housing and fighting for housing and, and citizens' rights to housing. Uh, you can't see it, unfortunately, uh, but there's this place is shuttered. I forget why. It might have been burned down, you know. And above that is like coming soon, luxury condos, you know, one, two, and three bedrooms. Typical, extremely typical. That was it, you know. Like I said before, you know, it was the fire, the body's coming down, knocking the building down. The fourth part of that, you know, module is luxury housing moving right in. I mean, right in. You could set your watch to it, and Juan fought, fought really, really hard to try and change things. And then this is a, a runoff of that. Covered a lot of that. Uh, love that the people of United will never be defeated. <laughs> Heard that a zillion times, right? And of course, there's, you know, I, I was just talking to who I just met tonight, with Pat. She's in the audience. You don't mind me relating a story, Pat? Thank you. Uh, Pat, lifelong resident in Hoboken, still here. Uh, served on a Hoboken Ambulance Corps for forever. <laughs> she was at all these scenes, worked all these scenes. 
And uh, to this day, she still looks for an escape route in her apartment. And that's, that's you know, that's pretty, uh, pretty telling of the trauma that people have gone through. You know, this poor kid, you know, I mean, there were a lot of kids that, that their shoes were set up, you know, making escape routes. Everybody knew how to get out of their apartments. And they really lived in fear of the fire. But I have, this is my shout out to uh, the uniform services, because the only picture I could find I really love of, uh, it's tender, it's giving back. It's just, you know, it was a fire up in Union City and this five-year-old was rescued uh, from her apartment. And this firefighter is just like, I mean, this is like a rock well, you know, sort of thing, <laughs> you know, where he spent so much time with this poor girl just to get her down to, you know, it's sweet. I just, I always love this photo. That's all I got. <laughs> questions, 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 questions. Yes, sir. Very technical question. Uh, two cameras. Yeah, black and white. Film. <laughs> Film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, black and white in film. I have one comment and two questions. Yeah. Um, I was a newspaper reporter in Stanford from 1980 to 86, then Tampa Tribune from 1986 to 93, and we weren't covering stories like this. Mm -hmm. So my, com my compliment to you is thank you for going through this hell. Thank you for being this chronicler of history. Thank you for not looking away. And thank you for your brilliant career, because you're amazing. Um, my question, I have two questions. One is, how lucky do you feel to have been born at the right time in history to be a newspaper photojournalist? Because I was born at the right time in history to be a newspaper reporter. When I was 12, I knew I wanted to be one. Any other time after that, it wouldn't have happened. And second of all, I'm new to Hoboken. I've lived here three years. What do you think of Hoboken now? It's like and thank you again. No, no, thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. Um, I never really thought about that, you know, being born at that time. And, but uh, when the fires were happening, I, I felt like even when I was shooting it, saying this is like a life changing thing, you know, in terms of my profession, this was going to be with me for the rest of my life. A lot of friends I had at that point worked in suburban newspapers, you know, and um, I would always joke with them. I go, you know, there was a water drought at that time too, around 7980, and they ran a, the Bergen Record ran a picture of uh, a sprinkler at a golf course, <laughs> and I forget who shot it, and I just said, oh, riveting, riveting, <laughs> you know. Oh, Bill, you know, blah, 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 blah. I said, really, you know. Um, there, I could never exist in that. I mean, it just, you know, a drought at a golf course, it doesn't mean anything to me. Who's going to benefit from that? You know. Um, so I felt very privileged to have found the dispatch at that time because we had reporters that were just incredible. I mean, they were just starting their journey. You know, like uh, Adrian Venepe, uh, 
uh, Jim Dwyer, uh, Lena Sun, you know, all these names that are, are just pretty legendary in the newspaper industry and they're really good. I just felt so privileged and honored to work with them, you know. Um, and it was a learning curve at the paper because everyone was just starting. So just one quick, this is a zillion stories, but uh, again, in the newsroom, theater, and Adrian Benepe's, he's got his notepad and he's got the phone crooked, you know, like that, that was the classic, you know. And everyone could hear everything you say. And Adrian's like, he's got his pen and he's just going, really? Really, Mayor? You're kidding? Really? Really? This goes on for like 15 minutes, and we're like, he's burning through, you know, notebooks like there's no tomorrow. And then there's like a, a, a 15 second pause of silence. And you hear Adrian go, that was all off the record? <laughs> <laughs> Never forget a true story. Uh, it was hilarious. So everyone had their learning curve, you know, there, photographers and reporters. Uh, but everyone, so privileged, you know, to work with those folks, you know. So, thank you for your comment. Well, I just wanted to point that you're <laughs> not in this, I mean, you were in war. Yeah, and yeah, it was, it was crazy. I mean, I, I actually, in my portfolio, I couldn't find half the pictures, believe me. Uh, I was up in Western Massachusetts uh, at a different paper for four years, and I freelanced at the Hartford Current, and I went in, I, I showed, uh, the photo editor at that time, she says, come in Sunday, it'll be quiet, I can look at your stuff, we'll see if, you know. So she's going through my portfolio, and it's just four years of, you know. And her face just went, you know, to like, she's like, oh, this is so depressing. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm like, Terry, that was her name, Terry. I said, Terry, I, I, I wasn't in Disney World the last four years, you know. It, it, this is it, this is the real, you know, reality when I was, uh, in Hudson County, so yeah, big impact, big impact. Yes, Tom. Uh, he is recognized nationally for, I mean, the portrayal that you guys put out during that time was honestly I mean, not, not that, of course, you were seeking that out, but I mean, it's no, I mean, if, if the body count was real high. I hate to talk in terms like that, but if the body count was real high, like 23 on Clinton Street. 23 fatalities, you know. Um, the Times would do something on it, you know. Uh, that would be it. We're the only game in town that did real detailed covering a spectrum of housing, poverty, economic factors, ineptitude of city government, county government, you know, corruption, how that played into, it was a really a, just a toxic mix. It wasn't one person committing arson. It, it was all encompassing, and it was really frustrating to try and weed out what was going on and what we do to, to highlight and, and bring it to the forefront so it could affect change. That's what we did, you know? So, anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, in 1982, the, the shelter was founded, the Hoboken Shelter, where you were a staffer. Yeah. And uh, just a few weeks ago, I don't know if you saw, they just served her three millionth meal. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah, that was, uh, that was an, a special uh, event. And I, I was just wondering if you could just talk just a little bit about the connection in 82 of the, the original founding and your original work there at the shelter with these fires. Just a little bit about that. Honestly, I, I, I knew, um, I remember the work of Sister Norberta back then, um, but I, I'm not, Mark Singleton, uh, he's going to be speaking, I think, uh, next, next week, week, is it? Next week, next week. I, I feel out of place. I mean, Mark can really accurately give everyone what transpired at, at that point in time in the history of the Hoboken Shelter. Um, but yeah, but Sister Norberta was like, uh, the one quote I found from her was hilarious. She's like, uh, she's like, she formed the group. I can't remember the name, but it's a Spanish name. Okay, thank you, Holly. And um, she says, uh, and then two other groups formed, and they made three. And she said, she says, well, it's a lot better now because when I go in, 
the mayor actually listens. <laughs> you know, she was like, uh, she didn't sugarcoat anything you might say, but uh, that's all I can remember. And I think, really think Mark is, is the one to, to highlight uh, the birth of the shelter and, and the ongoing work that goes on there. So, but, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to ask, what are you doing now to keep out of trouble? Uh, well, I still, you know, I, I, I was working at the Hobart Shelter for a bunch, and then I left about four months ago, but I still do work at St. Matthew's Church right down the road uh, at the Lunchtime Ministry, which is a, a lunch for basically, you know, anyone, but majority of folks there are on the edge, you know, uh, either on the street or in, in unstable housing situations. Um, and we provide food. I love to cook, so, you know, it's like a match made in heaven, <laughs> compassion and cooking. Um, so I do that, and it's really funny you asked that question because I was thinking this work is so far removed from what I do now. And I just find that I, I gravitate towards peaceful scenes. Uh, just anything is peaceful, you know. Uh, so I've been working and doing stuff like a, going down to the Meadowlands, which isn't far from where I, I live. Around sunset, usually in the winter, a beautiful, absolutely beautiful, no one actually sees because no one knows where this place is, this park. And I find that really, uh, I love it. You know, and I do pinhole photography, which if you don't know is a photography on film there's no lens, it's just a pinhole, you know. It's really remarkable, it just fascinates me. So alternative photography is what I'm, I'm doing now. So, so where's the park? <laughs> Anyone? Need a park? I guess I can make a count. <clears throat> hey, what's going on, Bill? Um, I'm just going to make a comment. I don't have a question. Yeah. Because we've spoken. <laughs> Zillion times. Yeah. Um, but if anyone, uh, you quoted in your presentation a Carmen Tirado, um, who was a survivor of the Pinner Hotel. And if anybody hasn't had an opportunity to see the show here, um, she's seen in a photograph just back there. Um, and there's also a, a recording connected to that where you can hear from Carmen directly about her experiences. Yeah. This is Chris Lopez, folks. It started with this guy. You called me, what, two years ago? Two years ago. Yeah, this is what Chris Lopez or whatever, <laughs> you know. And, uh, you know, like I said before, my stuff, my old stuff, uh, they're in shoe boxes, they're in Kodak, photo boxes, that, you know, that are falling apart. Up on my storage area, which is just a train wreck of a, you know, and just digging through stuff that the newspaper clippings were falling apart, you know. Uh, but, you know, it started with Chris, and thank God Bob Forster was here to get this stuff up, get the show up on the wall. Uh, huge, huge shout out to, to, to Bob and huge Chris. I mean, geez, you know. Um, also, um, I, again, I'm sorry, I don't mean to like plug the show, <laughs> but, um, Shameless. yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I encourage everyone to kind of follow up and listen to some of the oral histories that are attached to some of these portraits. Yeah. Um, as we speak about people that were he recognized as heroes, uh, in the city, um, fire firemen who very valiant and very brave to fight these fires. Um, but uh, if you listen, I, what I meant to say before when I was speaking about Carmen Tirado is that uh, if you listen to the oral history of that family, the Tirados who survived the Printer Hotel fire, um, the, 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 the son and the daughter, uh, Carmen and John, as well saved lives that day. Um, he was 11 years old and he caught a boy that had fallen. Oh, God. And so he isn't a person that's really recognized in the city as a hero but I hope maybe through my work that can change. Um, also, the daughter had helped children escape the building. Um, <clears throat> there was a door in the basement that had been nailed shut 
and she was 13 years old, and she kicked it open and had saved kids from the building too. So there's a lot of people, everyday people in the city that were equally as courageous. Uh, photograph, thank you for including of Juan Garcia, who is also a person that should be celebrated in the city. Absolutely, whom isn't. without question, yeah. Um, and so many other um, regular everyday folk in the city who rolled up their sleeves, uh, saved lives. Um, so thanks for your work, Bill, and, and, and sharing those photos and doing that, man. I appreciate you. Yes, ma'am. they stop you from, I mean, like what happened with investigations even from the investigative teams at the, at the dispatch with regard to the people who might have done this? Uh, you mean back then in yeah, 1982? Because I know that you were said that you were, they did a lot of good investigation. I have a big voice anyway. They did, did a lot of investigation of politicians. So I was just kind of curious as to like what happened with investigations of all of this. It's a good question. It's, a, it's very, very involved. And, and, but basically, I mean, you, city government was not equipped to handle this. They just weren't. Like no one. You know? After some certain pictures ran, uh, somebody in the mayor's office leaked. You know, they, we called it dropping a dime back then. There were pay phones, you know? And someone would call up the paper and say, hey, give us a tip. And I remember running down, probably with Chuck Sutton down to City Hall in Hoboken, to Kathy Allo's office. And the door was shut, and then someone went in and said, hey, the press is out here. The door cracked a little, Kathy Allo comes out. I can tell inside the room, and his office is darkened. There were slides going on. And, you know, I recall when it was federal government, I forget what branch, my memory doesn't serve me a thousand percent. And that was the start, really, of, of forming a strategy to stop the cycle of arson in the area, which included uh, schools, educating kids, caring for kids that are coming to school. There, we did a story about an elementary school in Hoboken, and the art teacher there said, I want you to see some of these drawings. So Chuck and I go down, and of course, she wanted the kids to express how they feel about what's going on. And, as you would imagine, you know, there, there were crayon drawings of fires and flames and people jumping. Uh, so it started taking on a, a more robust um, team effort. But up until that point, they just they weren't capable. I mean, you know, Steve Capiello would say, uh, the, you know, the, the um, fire alarms law, which was put into effect, people had a year to get them in. And I think it was only for interior, not for hallways. And the, the gold standard of any fire alarm system, it's got to be electric, not battery, in the hallways, and you can't shut them off unless you have you know, a key. And as we all know, whoever cooks in an apartment or a house with a fire alarm, what's the first thing you do? You take the battery out, right? <laughs> and plus, if the fire, 95% of these fires always started in the hallway, Always in the middle of the night, never during the day. And the hallway would just hit with an accelerant, would just draft up. And that smoke, it took a while for smoke to get into the, the individual apartments. So even those types of fire alarms. But my point is this, is that, you know, the mayor back then said in an actual quote, I don't have the manpower to enforce that. Hello, you're the mayor. Strip naked, go in, walk into the, the governor's office naked. We have to do something. Lead. So I, you know, it's the best I can do. I'm sorry, <laughs> but. It was also I lived in a tenant building. What happened was they extended the fire extinguisher, yeah. not fire extinguisher, the fire uh, escape system. They actually made it bigger. Okay. So in my building. Yeah. So, because yeah. they said that supposing someone is in the bathroom, there's a fire, and they'd lock the door, and they can't get to the fire escape. So they extended the fire escape all around to the, to the kitchen. And that's what back, you do. The back room. Yeah. That, you know. 
Yeah, certainly, certainly. So that's change. That was a change, yeah. Then yeah. we saw fireworks within the hallway. Yep. Electric, that was a change. Change. So out of this madness, yeah, there, are, there were really effective changes made. And then, of course, break the system with anything new became another thing. Yeah, yeah. So code enforcement, which, you know, was sort of not non-existent, but it was sort of there. Uh, and it was always the same thing. We don't have the manpower. No, please, you know, spare me. Do it. They were private. For example, the Pinter Hotel was for sale by the Pinter family. They lived in Bayonne at that point. It was for sale for three years. You know how much they wanted for it? No. One five-story structure. Uh, 30,000. 30, Bingo. Yep. 30,000. 30,000. I'm Yeah, 30,000. I know my numbers. Very good. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here. In your opinion, did you not possibly feel the city officials didn't really want to fix the problem? In yeah. your opinion. Of course. And you're not, you're not putting me on the spot. Uh, I don't think they were capable. That's a nice line. Not bad, right? It's not a bad line, but there, there could have been some things that could have been done. It seemed like too many people and organizations and departments allowed a little too much to happen. And I just was wondering how much of an effort did they really, really want to put into trying to stop this? I mean, certainly it might have crossed your mind. There's a little too many fires. Every day that crossed everyone's mind in the newsroom, the dispatch, yeah, okay. absolutely. It, it was frustrating. It was very, very frustrating. I mean, yeah. when, I, when I moved here in 87, and I'd heard about the fires, and there were a few fires afterwards that were stunning to me that, that put me on edge, mm -hmm. I could not believe, because I'm call me naive, I could not believe somebody would burn a person out of their home. I could not believe that they would chance murder. I mean, call me naive, but I, I didn't realize that that kind of person existed in this city. Oh, they do. They do. They do. They do. But then I realized, too, in 1987, the corruption was still heavy. Very heavy. It's Very Hudson heavy. County. Yeah, so I, I'm not surprised, but it just stuns me. And of course, nobody ever was caught. And yeah. that seems a little strange because somebody's bound to talk, but it's like nobody wanted to talk. That's just my thoughts. Thank okay. you. Appreciate you did it. a fine, shockingly visual to me uh, presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oh, don't get me going on that. <laughs> I mean, you guys have changed the history of the election Absolutely. Absolutely. But in today's media climate, where? You know, I mean, it's, it's newspapers back then were very, very strong. Very strong. We got three papers on Sunday. You know, one or two during the week. They were the Bible. You went by the Bible. And now it's like, you know, I'm not mocking Hoboken girl, but you know, I, I, I could care less who has the best latte in the city of Hoboken, you know? It's well, not hard hitting. Uh, and certainly you won't make any change, you know, of things that are wrong, but Hoboken's a whole different ball game now, a whole different world. You know, you walk out these doors, you'll, I'm like, what is this strange land, you know? Like, this used to be Maxwell House Coffee, you know? People's families would work there, generations, you know, and now it's 
whatever, you know. Um, yeah, so it, it's 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 not easy. And, and TV, even back then, TV was a joke, you know. It, Yeah, of course, if they want to. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, Tom. Did you feel any, or ever receive any threats from your staff, like covering? Can you repeat Russia? that, Bill? Just repeat this question. Oh, sure, sure. Tom, Tom is asking if uh, if there are any threats placed on us uh, in general at, at, at the dispatch. If you stand with the camera on any scene whether it's crime or fire or whatever. And it's very, it's, it's, there's a lot of emotion on the, on the surface. You really have to judge because you're on your forehead, if you're carrying a camera, there's a bullseye. And I've had that happen many times. You know, people come up and go, you son of a whatever. You know, you just gotta, you have to, you have to work through that. You have to understand why that person said it. It's that simple. It really is. And you, and you look to what, what is the better good here, you know. Uh, there's things that um, you photograph and just they have to be seen. They just have to, to make a change, you know. You don't just say, oh, you know, I'll walk away. No. So, but yeah, the sort of threats in the street, yeah, that, that's, yeah. Question. It was so corrupt back then, Tom. It was nuts. It was like there was one guy, Bob Body, who was director of DPW up in Union City, right? So <laughs> he loved getting his picture taken. It didn't matter what. <laughs> matter of fact, when he was indicted, Jim Dwyer was telling me he, he did a piece, he did an investigative piece on this guy who set up phony shell companies, right? And uh, Jim says, Bill, you think $25 is too much for a broom? I said, yeah. And he set up these shell companies that didn't exist. There was one in Ohio. There was an empty office at the end of an empty building, you know. So when Bob Barty was indicted, Jim comes up to me and says, he's got a call. You got to go out to Newark and get him going in. <laughs> it was that the question. crazy. Yeah, I have another question. Sure. Um, well, first of all, in answer to the lady who wondered how someone could do that, follow the money. That's what every journalist knows. It's follow yeah. the money. And my question for you is that wonderful picture you had of the burned out building and then luxury condos coming. They won. It was very, very typical. They very, won. Very, very yeah. typical. Seems like they won. Yeah. Very typical. Yeah. I mean, how do you feel about Hoboken now? About? Uh, I mean, you can't afford to live here. It's hard to live here. Um, it's luxury buildings. It's Millennials who move here for a while and then they have their first child and then they have their second yeah, child and move uh, off to the suburbs. Yeah. It's Hoboken housing is kind of substandard. Um, a lot of people in the prime part of that, way back in the center of it, they are living with roaches and rats and children are growing up that way. So nobody's noticing that for some reason. Well, th things are a little bit better, as, as this gentleman alluded to. You know, there were changes in construction code. There were changes in enforcement of construction code and, and related issues with fire. Uh, you know, entryways that have steel doors, you know. Uh, just one second. And those improvements really enhanced living situations to be safer in the city. Back then, it was Wild West, you know. Everything was wood, just insanely not safe, you know. And there were vast, there were blocks of just empty buildings, you know, that, you know, uh, provided haven for, for folks on the street, then fire would start, and same scenario. Uh, so it's, it's, it's safer now, you know, I think for a majority of people. Uh, just from that aspect, but um, what the city is now, it's like it's just another planet to me, you know, it just is, you know. The New York Times, when Hope Owen was going through this and started, I can't say improving, so the New York Times ran an actual story that on Washington Street in Hoboken, 
a Haagen-Dazs ice cream store opened up. And that was a big story. Because, <laughs> you know, it was Hoboken was dotted with mom and pop stores, loved mom and pop stores. It's hard to find those stores now. It really is, you know? For ATMs, you know? Um, it's hard to find those stores now. And that neighborhood feeling, uh, you know, it's hard to find small vegetable places, you know, to go and get vegetables. You know, it change, it's change. No problem with that, it's fine. You know, it's great, it's just change. Back then, I had a real problem with that, you know, because of people dying, you know, to affect that, that change. Now, now, you know, it's, if you can afford it, it's out there, you know, so. Yeah. Anyone else? We're done. Cool. All right. I'm so glad we taped this. I can't wait to get the phone calls on Monday. Um, I, uh, I do want to just recognize Pastor Elaine Ellis uh, Thomas, who's in the back, just give us a wave. Uh, she and a group of people, including Holly Metzer, is here, uh, put together a memorial plaque project that was just unveiled three weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, and the plaque is very dignified, looks great. It's over at what we call Tom Oliveri Park, right across from the Wallace School, 12th and Willow, and uh, just went up and it recognizes the intentional fires that happened during the same time period and was not really coordinated with this exhibit, but kind of all happened together. And Tommy Malta, who is still the head of the Ambulance Corps, he, when we did that ceremony, said, hey, I can't believe this took so long or a long time in coming. So if you do go by there, stop, take a pause. And uh, I like to think of the interior space here as the Hoboken community with heart. So I hope that's true. Thanks for coming. Uh, Christopher Lopez is the curator of the exhibit. Um, he will be talking in a few weeks uh, along with uh, uh, Yumaira Figura Vasquez. That's on April 16th. And as I mentioned, April 2nd, uh, Mark Singleton and Rand Hopp will have a discussion about the early years of the shelter, which is probably needed maybe even more than when it was founded. It definitely provides more resources and is an institution. So again, thank you, Bill, for sharing. And this was a great gift, great afternoon. Uh, have some refreshments. Uh, we're going to fold up chairs. Uh, Bill probably would answer questions one-on-one. -on -one. want to thank Rand Hoppe for doing the tech thing and keeping this out there. Uh, Evan. Papa, Papa George, yeah, uh, is a student at Stevens, and he's being trained to take carry on the torch here with this. Uh, Tara Chand, raise your hand. Tara is the person who uh, generally is the associate down at the Fire Museum, which the museum also runs uh, at 213 Bloomfield. That's open on weekends. And please spread the word about the exhibit and tuning out. Okay, thanks a lot.